In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 10 is where I want to kick off the whole sermon, but I want to read one verse. I want to read one verse, guys. Here it is. It's in Acts 17.30. This verse in Acts 17.30 says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. I want to talk about repentance today. What it is, what it isn't, and who needs it. But here's a command. My first section of the text, I call the command and call for repentance. And in Acts 17.30, we see God commands all men everywhere. All men everywhere. Could not be a more broad sentence than that. All men everywhere need to repent. So it doesn't matter what you believe, who you are, what you currently, what you believe, what you plan to believe in the future, you need to come broken before your Savior, bow the knee before Christ our Savior. Trust Him as your Savior. But here in Matthew 9, I want to show you the call for repentance. Matthew 9, verse 10 says, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That last phrase says, God's come to call sinners to repentance. I call this God's call for repentance. You notice there's a difference. God commands everyone to repent, but God specifically is calling these sinners, these publicans and sinners, just your everyday average Joes aren't spiritual Pharisees whatever you, or, or Sadducees, whatever you want to call them. They're just average people. God's calling them to repentance. I note that to mean God's calling, God's working with them, God's extending His hand, God's saying, I want to save you. He's long-suffering towards them. He wants to work with them because they can be worked with. They have a heart that is not hardened by pride and success. They have a heart that is softened by the insecurities they have, by the imperfections they have, by the hardship in life they have. Their heart is closer to seeking God, and God's there calling for them. I say this, and then I submit to you that our world today is full of Pharisees, not publicans and sinners. Everyone today in their own scheme, in their own scheming of their righteousness and their religion, their way, their faith, their belief system, they think they're okay. They've hardened their hearts. This is the majority of the world uh, and across the whole spectrum, every kind of spectrum, economic spectrum, even the rich and the poor, they even they have hard hearts today. So God is calling out for those few who think they have a problem, who think they need something, who think they need mercy, who think... They might need to repent. We're going to look over at Luke for a second. I'll do most of the preaching today out of Matthew, some out of Luke, and then I'm only going to ask you to jump a couple other spots, but please go to Luke chapter 15, just for one verse, and then we'll go a few chapters before this. Luke 15. I read this verse last week. Say, Logan, you're repeating yourself. Well, last week I was really talking about how heaven's watching our service, and we're one sinner making a choice to get saved. Now I want to show you the end of that verse and, and key in on that. Luke 15, verse 7. Luke 15, 7 says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. I preach it many times, so I won't labor the point. Would you please look at those last four words, which need no repentance? That's our world today. People think, there's no need for repentance. Why? What have I done wrong that's so bad? What's so wrong with me in my life? I've been trying to be pretty good. I've been doing good things. I'm better than that guy over there. And why should I repent? Is there really some God that's really going to hold me accountable for the sin in my life? There's some God that's really so holy that sin's appalling to him? Yes, there is. It's the real God who created you and holds your breath in his hands. There is a need for repentance. Don't be like the 90 and 9, that's 99 just persons, which say there's no need for repentance. Be that one person who comes before God and repents. And I'm going to explain to you exactly what repentance is and is not. But now continuing on the need for repentance, look back a chapter earlier. Look at Luke 13. Luke 13 and verse... One, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans 
whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above the Galileans, uh, sinners above the Galileans because they offered such things? I read that poorly. Let me read it again, would you? Suppose ye that, th that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they, they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. There was a, a thought here going on that there was some people were being judged by Pilate's judgment because they were extra wicked. Their life was going bad because they were extra wicked. Jesus says, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And verse 4 says, Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So apparently some tower named Siloam just out of random circumstances just fell down and crushed a bunch of people. And then the saying was, all those people that got crushed, they were very wicked. They must have really been wicked. Jesus says, no. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Except you repent, you're all going to come to an untimely end, a death that is sad, that is broken, that is abrupt. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Jesus is pointing out the need for repentance, and it is universal, affecting all of us. All of us need to repent. I will read you some verses. If you will, bear with me as I try to read these verses plainly. John 8, 24 says, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. The need for repentance is that you have a big sin problem that's not taken care of. And John 8, 24 talks about if you do not have a Savior, then you die in those sins and you own them. As I preached last week, they are yours to pay for if you die in them. John, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you accept Christ's gift, you have eternal life. If you don't accept Christ's gift, the penalty you'll pay is death. Death in hell, according to this context. Death in hell. Eternity in hell. The wages of sin is death. John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You're condemned because you have not believed. That's the state you sit in today without repentance. Hebrews 2.3 says, and I shared this one in Sunday school, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You will not escape. You will not escape the penalty for your sin unless you accept the salvation that's in Jesus Christ. Acts 3.19 says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. So why do we need repentance? So that your sins may be blotted out. That your sins may be washed away. Covering this quickly. Covering this quickly, and I'm glad. I want you to stay right with you, as now we talk about what is repentance. So hopefully in your mind you have established now that repentance is commanded, it's called for, and it's needful. What is repentance? Anybody in this room, think about that. This is, this is good even for the Christian believer, I think, to, to really hone in on. What is repentance? I looked at Webster's Dictionary. It said about any, any average Webster's Dictionary will have something along these lines. Webster's Dictionary gives three different definitions for the word repentance. And two of them are not biblical. And this is, I want to say this. I'm a big fan of read your Bible and have a dictionary handy because it's a good way to study the Bible. Make sure you know what the words mean. And even older dictionaries I think are better because we're kind of losing the meaning of some words as we go a long time here as our English language is waning and drifting away from how pure and perfect it was. But, but for this one I say use a dictionary but also we need to look at context because the context of the Bible will better explain what repentance is. And I don't want you to go down a wrong path. For instance, the primary definition for the word repentance in Webster's Dictionary says to turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. Okay? This is a problem. This is a wrong definition of repentance. And the biblical definition of repentance. It says, and I'll read it again, to turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. So your repentance is dedicating yourself to amending your life, to fixing your life up. Sounds like penance, doesn't it? Sounds like a Catholic notion, doesn't it? Catholic notion that's also spread across all of Christendom and into all other cults 
where we need to do these works. Repentance is this ongoing process of earning salvation. And earning salvation, it's poppycock. Poppycock. But you can get that from a poor definition of repentance. Romans 10, 3 says, they've, they're going about to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. We need to submit ourselves unto God's righteousness, not our own, because our righteousness is worthless, as I'll show you with these verses. Matthew 9, 13. Please listen again. I thank you for your patience. Matthew 9, 13 says, I will have mercy. We already read this one. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Remember, God's not working with those people who think they're, they're amending their lives. They're fixing their lives up. God's not working with those people. God's working with those people who say, oh, my life's a mess, unfixable mess. I need a solution outside of me. That's who God's working with. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Can't be any more clear in Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. But nevertheless, every door I knock on, 99% of doors think salvation has to do with how good they are, that good works they're doing. It's riddled our world. It's, it's a terrible, damning belief yes. to think that you're going to amend your life. Yes. And that's how you achieve salvation. Isaiah 64, 6 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. That verse, I say it again and again, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The very best things we do are filthy rags in the eyes of a holy God. To talk about self-reformation or amending your life, would you please look back at Matthew. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. I don't plan to be too long today. We're breezing through it pretty well. But I want to give you a good definition of repentance, true repentance, so then you can make the decision about what you believe. Matthew 12, verse 43. This is a pretty deep text, and we, we could study it all day long. Matthew 12, 43 says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return unto my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. I want to I want to explain this the best of my abilities here. With God's help, this is talking about, it says an unclean spirit has gone out of a man. Before you come to Christ, your father's the devil. We know that, right? We know that from Scripture. Before you come to the Savior, you're, you're, the God of this world, that's your father, your spiritual father, the one you're following down this wicked uh, path of sin. But... In life, it talks about there are there's unclean spirits that work inside the hearts of the unsaved, and sometimes they'll go out of man. And so in this instance, it talks about this unclean spirit left an individual. So now, this is an open individual. They can choose. Now, maybe God was working on this person's heart, and right at this point, they could have chosen to say, I'm going to let Jesus Christ come into my heart. I'm going to accept Christ as my Savior. God will be my Heavenly Father. And everything will be great. This person will be a Christian who then is sharing the faith. They do not make that decision. Watch what happens. Instead, he didn't make that decision. He and his his house was empty, swept and garnished. And then the unclean spirit saith, "Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell therein. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation." This passage, it takes a deep study to understand it perfectly, but it's talking about self-reformation. Those people who say, you know, i got a problem. I'm an alcoholic. I need to turn my life around. You know, i got a problem. I've had seven you know, or two marriages that have fallen apart. I need to turn my life around. You know, i got a problem. I've lost my job. I need to turn my life around. They do self-reformation that's not spirit-led. Sometimes what they turn into is that twice-dead, two-fold child of the devil. Yes. That person who has self-reformed and now they're stronger they're more impactful they have this presence this aura of someone who has achieved greatness just like a pharisee a pharisee who has now they've pulled themselves by their own bootstraps they've gone through aa they found truth somewhere and now they're confident in it but if it's not in god they're just a more confident sparkling pleasant child of the devil When God's working on your heart, you have two routes. 
Choose reformation that is of the heart, that is godly, that is God-centered, that God completely creates a new heart in you. It's a deep passage, I know, but we're studying. That's what you find in churches today. Twice dead people who have just this outward appearance of righteousness, but inwardly they're dead man's bones. Their, their mouth is an open sepulcher, meaning within them is just death. We covered that in Sunday school this morning. That's the worthlessness of self-reformation. Okay, so that's definition number one is to turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. Wrong. That's not the repentance of the Bible. That's not the repentance God commands or God calls for. The second definition of repentance goes like this. To feel regret or contrition. So, you feel regret. You feel sadness. You feel remorse, right? To look at this concept, please look back, way back in Genesis chapter 25. I got a, I got a couple of key passages, uh, but the sermon I don't think will be too long today. Genesis 25. I want to show you this story, because um, then it's referenced in the New Testament. It teaches us a great lesson. Genesis 25, 27 says in the story of uh, Jacob and Esau. Genesis 25, 27. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. Okay, so just quickly I want to point out that Esau is a successful one. Esau is a man of the world. Everything you like about him, he's smart, cunning hunter, strong. He's got a lot of things going for him. He is someone to admire in this world. He has success in this world. And frankly, it goes to his head and he becomes a fleshly man. Fleshly man who cares more about this temporal because the temporal is working out for him just fine. We see that in life today. The successful get distracted by their success. It doesn't mean you can't come back from it, look for the Savior. I'm just saying, be mindful. But anyways, Esau came back from the field and was faint. One of his hunting trips, he's tired here. And verse 30, And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. 31, And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. So this thing called a birthright. He's going to inherit this blessing from his father called a birthright. You can't see it, you can't touch it, but his father is going to bless him because he's the firstborn. Jacob wants this thing that you can't see and you can't touch. It takes faith to kind of believe in it. There's this future blessing coming. Jacob wants it. Jacob, as we read the scriptures, Jacob is a man of faith. He's not always a nice guy, not always a righteous guy, but he has faith, and, ja and Jacob has that. We know that. Esau has no faith. Esau is looking at the temporal. Esau just simply wants to fill his belly. He's feeling faint from a, from a hunt. He, he wants something to nourish his current state. And 32, And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. I think he sounds a little overly dramatic. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? It's doing me no good, this future faith I'm counting in. And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau is the worldly man who cares more about the temporal things than heavenly things, eternal things. I'll show you exactly how this ties into our message today by looking over at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12. Esau made this mistake, right? He learns later on that it was a big mistake. Giving up your birthright, that was a dumb thing to do. It's a big deal being the firstborn <coughs> back in these days, for sure. Hebrews chapter 12, look at this. Went back to the end of your Bible. Hebrews 12 and verse 16 says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. So one little thing in this world... He forgot about God. He forgot about eternal things. But one little thing, he sold his birthright. 17, for we know how that afterward, and here we learn the insight, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. There's that word repentance, and here's how it ties into the message is this. Esau, after the fact, he sold his birthright for, for a mess of pottage, and then he was sad about it. He regretted it, right? He regretted it. But this verse says he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He was crying. He was sad, upset, made a mistake. 
But you know what he's sad about? Esau is sad about, him, about his circumstances, not his sin. He's sad about his circumstances, not his sin. He's not upset about the mistake he made. He's upset with his life now. He doesn't have the blessings that he could have had. His life could be going smoother. He could be richer, more well off at this point. He's sad about his circumstances. He's, he wants God to fix his temporal problems, but that's not repentance. It's not repentance. We touched on this last week as well. I believe God's having me bring it forth in today's age for a reason. Uh, but you don't need a better life, people. You don't need a better life. You need eternal life. And as I said last week, you don't need an assistant. You need a Savior. We don't just God is not just this th person we lean on to help us out in this life. He's not temporal. Think about eternal things. So Esau sought at heart with tears. Lots of times when we talk about repentance, we think about, oh, I got really emotionally worked up to repent. I got be really sad about stuff, sad about stuff, sad about stuff. Well, I'll talk about godly sorrow in a second. But no, that's just not it. That's not it. Repentance is not just being sad. Because lots of times we're just sad because well, we're not happy as we should be. We don't have everything we want to have. We're sad about our circumstances, not our sin. Before I move on from this point, though, I do want to show you that godly sorrow can play a role. As the preaching the gospel goes forth, you can become sorry about your sin, and that's okay. That will lead you to salvation, that route too. Look over at, um, well, I'll read it for you so you don't have trouble turning there, but 2 Corinthians 7, 9-10 through 10 says, 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10 says, Now I rejoice that ye were made sorry. Paul's writing a letter to the Corinth church. He says, Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow work with repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world work with death. Godly sorrow work with repentance to salvation. That's what I want you to take away from that. Paul preached some hard sermons to Corinth. They became sorry about their sin, at least some of them did, and some of them got right. Churches today are more about making you feel sorry about your circumstances. That's why they do these financial seminars. So come get your finances in order at the Baptist church now. Or here, come get your marriage in order at the Baptist church here. Or come, you know, get your life back on track at the Baptist church here. Temporal fixes, I'm sorry. That's what our world offers. Temporal solutions for temporal problems. When the church and everything in our world should be looking at eternal things. We had our eternal things figured out. Our life, our temporal things would go just fine. Our world would be a wonderful place if we had God as our Heavenly Father. Okay, so that's the last one there. Or, or now I'll go to the last point about the, the dictionary definitions of repentance. First one was to amend, amend one's life. The second was to just feel regret or contrition. Not quite right. The best definition for repentance, the perfect definition for the word biblical, the biblical word repentance, you can see it play out in Matthew 21. Look at Matthew 21. And this is really the passage that got my mind going on this topic from the beginning. Matthew 21, look at 28. 21, 28, we'll see what true repentance is. 28 says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. We covered this in devotions the other day in my family. Hopefully my children remember this lesson. I thought they took it to heart. He came to the first. He said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. This first son is the publican, the sinner. Is, is the average person who we know we messed up. We had things to do in our life. We, we sin. We know we should seek the Savior. We said, no, I'm not going to seek the Savior. I'm going to sin. I'm going to sin. I'm going to sin. My life is over here. It's not with God. But then he repented and went. Amen. Repentance is a change of mind. Amen. Repentance is a change of mind. I want you to understand that. That's what true repentance is. You thought that you could do your own thing. I can do whatever I want. Later you come before God with a change of change of heart, change of mind. That's repentance. That's how it should be preached. That's how it should be understood in Scripture. I don't look much at, at Greek whatsoever, but for the word repentance, it does kind of help to understand it. Repentance in the Greek, the word is meta, metanoia. Metanoia in the Greek. And it has two parts. There. The meta means after, 
and noia means to think. So literally, it pretty much means to think about something after the fact and have a different opinion about it. Metanoia, repentance. You think about something after the fact, you have a different opinion on it. So you view your life now, as the Gospels preach, you view your life and you start thinking, you know, I thought those actions I, doing, I was doing was okay. I thought it was just my life to live. I thought I had this kind of freedom, this kind of liberty to do those things. But now you're saying, oh my goodness, no, that was sin. That was wrong. I can see sin throughout my life. Now that I look at my life, I can see, yeah, I've been sinning since, since six years, five, six years old. I've been sinning the whole way through. I can see all the decisions I've made have been wrong. That's repentance. A change of mind. A change of mind. But what kind of repentance do we get today? What kind of obedience to Scripture do we get today? It's seen in the second son. Verse 30, And it came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. He said he was going to go. Went not. That's the head knowledge we have in, in our churches today. I'm sorry. And a lot of the people who say they're Christians, that's what we have. They have just a head knowledge of God. They know that God's telling them to do something. They say, yeah, sign me up. Christ, that's great. You know, I, I love I love Christ. I've, I've said his name before. I've gone to church a couple times. I, I already go to church every week at this little worthless church down the street. Um, I go, sir, and went not. They, ha they haven't accepted Christ their Savior. They don't know Christ their Savior. No repentance. 31, he says, Whether of them twain did the will of his father. They saith unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. The publicans and the harlots, they, know, they knew they had messed up, right? They had messed up lives. Met harlots' life is not a pretty life. Messed up life. They heard they needed to repent, and they repented. They changed their mind. The Pharisees could not do this because they didn't think they needed to change from anything. What do I need to change from? I've been pretty darn good. I'm a Pharisee. In today's world, what do I need to change from? I'm pretty darn good. I'm, I'm American or whatever. I'm a Baptist. I'm a, I'm a liberal. I'm a conservative. I'm a you, you fill in the blank. If it's not a God-fearing, saved-by-grace Christian, it's worthless, and you're probably a Pharisee. Your pharisaical ideas of what held you back from coming to the Savior. Couldn't be explained any more clearly about what repentance is as in this passage in Matthew 19, or sorry, Matthew chapter 21. Change of mind, he repented and went. The second they say that they believe, but they don't go. They do not go. I want to talk about in the last section of my sermon here, and then, then we're done. I promise we're done. What does true repentance look like? So for those people, let's look at the what fruits look like for people who have truly repented and those who have not. Those who simply over here are just saying, yeah, I'm going. Yeah, I'm going. Look back a few pages to Matthew chapter 3. The preaching of repentance is throughout the Bible. And it's sad in today's world that repentance is, is seen as this archaic term that no pulpit should ever bring forward or no Christian should ever write on a sign. It's just something to be mocked, you know, repent. But it's the exact thing God commands us to do, is repent. Matthew 3, verse 1. John the Baptist, a very spiritual man, came in righteousness, Christ just said, preach repentance. 3, 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and of leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. John the Baptist, great preacher, great revival. He made a path for the Lord to come right after him. And you see what happened. He preaches repent. People confess their sins, change their mind. They know that those sins, that, that there was a problem there. Seven, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came out, and John the Baptist very well, he could have just said, Oh, I'm glad to see you. Please hop in the water here. Let's baptize you. You're going to be good to go. That's what a church would do today. 
But he says, what are you guys doing in here? You're the ones who say that you don't need repentance. And your whole life shows that you don't need repentance. You think you're, you're too good for it. He says, bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. He says, show me some life, show me some fruit from your life that says that you've repented of your sins. You acknowledge your sins and you've changed your mind on it. You said you were a sinner. That's what he's calling for. That's what churches today should be calling for. Fruits, meat for repentance. So what are fruits? Let's dig a little deeper. Dig a little deeper. And, and remember, what you remember, fruits aren't just words. It's not just saying what you believe. Because remember that one guy said, I go and he went not. So fruits aren't just words. Although testifying to Christ is great, but just let's prove it with our actions as the book of, uh, the book of James says. Prove your faith by your works. Look at Luke chapter... I, I'm told to hop back a little bit. Look at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Luke 8. I've got three passages to turn to. And that's all, and we're done. But Luke 8, verse 4. I'll, I'll skim through it quickly. You could preach a whole sermon just on this text. But Luke 8, 4, talking about how the Bible goes out, and it's not... Received or it is received. 8.4 says, And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. This is Jesus speaking here. 5. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit and a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Plant and seed. Some seed produced fruit, other seed did not. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? Verse 10. And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. So for one, we know that all fruit will come from the word of God. I want you to keep that in mind. All true fruit will come from the word of God. 12 says, Those by the wayside are they that hear, then come with the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Some people hear the gospel preached. They hear it presented. The devil's right there. He pulls it out real quickly, throws them a trick. A, a false notion in their head, something they've heard before, some lie about the Bible, they have some reason not to believe that seed that was planted and they don't believe. 13. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. Many Christians make the profession and say, oh yeah, I, I hear the gospel, I believe it. I believe it. You know, I, I got it covered. We're good to go. But it didn't root deep down in their hearts. It wasn't life-changing. They obviously did not recognize how severe their sin problem was and how great salvation in Christ is. Wasn't a deep belief in their heart, just a head knowledge again. And when hard times come for those Christians, and when hard times come for those false churches that are filled with those types of Christians, when hard times come, they fall away. When people start saying, do you really believe this book? This book that condemns, you know, different lifestyles? Do you believe that book, that hate book? No, I don't really believe it. Or, you know, they don't stand on the truth. You'll see how strong a faith you have when some, when some hard times come. How well you stand on God's word. 14. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they had heard go, that go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to, to perfection. Some people hear the gospel. They like the sound of it, but they like this world a little better. Like this world too much, the cares of this life, they choke that seed. It does not grow. They do not become saved. 15, or they not, they not get saved. 15, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, look at that, which in an honest and good heart, that's what's needed at the start, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Those are the ones that bring forth fruit a hundredfold. You see fruit in their life. Because they had a good, honest heart, they accepted the word, they believed the word, they believed in Christ their Savior, and fruit came out because of it. What are good fruits? I, I could go a whole other section here, but it's a different sermon for a different day. What are good fruits? Uh, good fruits are things that always revolve around the good seed. What's the seed? The word of God. People get that confused too. What are fruits? Well, that person over there, they give a, you know, they do all kinds of work for the poor. Or that person over there, I know they, they run a food pantry. This person over there, uh, whatever, they're sending all kinds of humanitarian programs. This person over here, they're running a really um, 
you know, they're, they're in politics and they're trying to make sure they're delving out um, wealth to all kinds of different people and, and caring about people and education, all these other social causes. No, true fruit will be directly attached to God's Word. God's Word. So, just some basics. There's a lot of different ways you can attach yourself to God's Word, but one, you're saved, you get baptized. And you, through baptism, you proclaim that you are a believer in Christ and His Word. You'll join a Bible-believing church, the ground and pillar of truth. You'll join a church, and you'll work from that church. And then your whole life will be centered on sharing God's Word. So either you're sharing God's Word directly, which everyone should be doing it to some extent, or you're supporting those who do, supporting missionaries, supporting churches, supporting other believers who are doing those kinds of things. That's fruit. True fruit will be centered on the Word of God. I'll leave you with two verses. Psalms 126.6 says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Sometimes the Christian life is hard. But that's a promise in God's word. You go forward bearing that precious seed. In Psalms 126.6, it's a promise. You'll come again rejoicing. Neat promise, isn't it? Yes. The Christian life is the best life. A real purpose in life. Bearing that precious seed. Telling people about the Bible. And that's what you tell them. Don't tell them any of your wisdom. It's good for nothing. My wisdom is good for nothing. Tell them the Bible. 2 Peter 3.9 says, this is the last verse, Last verse. I'll show you the heart of God again. 2 Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not willing that any should perish. That's a true fact. He doesn't want anyone to go into hell. That's not why he created you to go to hell. But it's a fact if you do not repent. He wants all to come to repentance. If you don't repent, you do not change your mind about who you are, your sin problem, and your need for the Savior, then you will perish. You will spend eternity in hell. That's the, that's the very straightforward truth of the Bible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for these passages, for the idea, for explaining the idea of repentance to us so that we could understand it by giving us different parables that really help us hone in on what you mean by repentance. Lord, I pray that you'd help the world and those, those we love in this community to heed your command for repentance. Those who are publicans and sinners, admittedly, who, don't, who are not full of themselves, not full of pride, to heed your call. Maybe you're working on their hearts, Lord. I pray that, you, that they would heed your call and become Christians. Just in my prayer, amen.